and uh, great, excellent, thank you. Um, so again, I just want everyone to know that we are um, recording. And so if you are interested in um, not appearing, our goal will be to, to pin the speaker at the given moment, but we just wanna make sure that everyone's clear on that. Um, Okay, so some quick introductions and just a couple of announcements before we get started. Um, I'm Jennifer Borland and I am the director of the Humanities Initiative and I also teach in, um, in art history in the Department of Art, Graphic Design and Art History. And um, I also have a couple of other Humanities Initiative folks here that I want to introduce. Uh, Sarah Milligan, who is the head of the um, Oklahoma Oral History Research Project, which is based in the library, um, and she's co-director of the Humanities Initiative this year, and also um, Jace Earwood, who is our GTA for the Humanities Initiative, and also um, an MA student in art history. Um, the uh, event today um, is sponsored by the Humanities Initiative, which is a new initiative that was launched this fall with the mission of increasing the visibility of the humanities on campus and also fostering new kinds of, especially collaborative research. And you can learn more about us by going to the website, which you should be able to see in the chat. I also wanted to mention if you are interested in being added to any of our um, uh, communications, email lists, et cetera, you can drop us an email at our um, email, which Jace will also pop in the chat right now. Um, and uh, there's a few events coming up that I wanted to mention really quickly. Um, and you can always find info about those uh, on our website as well. And um, we hope to be adding additional events um, in addition to the ones that are there so far. Um, but coming up, we have um, Dr. Brandy Thomas-Wells, um, who will be speaking today, but is also presenting with a panel of former students on February 1st, Tuesday, February 1st, 10.30 to 11.30 Central, um, to talk about um, working on the very um, uh, acclaimed and important new digital research uh, that it went into a digital resource called the Women of Black Wall Street, which I'm sure that we'll be hearing more about today. Um, but I just wanna make sure that everyone's aware of that event. And then on March 1st, we are hosting folklorist Dr. Andrea Kitta from East Carolina University, who is going to be speaking about bat soup and signs of the beast, COVID legend, legends and conspiracy theories, um, which will be a hopefully in-person lecture um, and also doing a workshop possibly also in person where we're still hoping that that will work out that way. Um, the following day called talking to others about COVID, about the COVID vaccine, how to discuss legends, rumors and conspiracy theories with your loved ones. Uh, and that second event would require registration. So you again can find info on our website for those. Um, and today's event is one of a series of three virtual events that we are running this spring semester. The other two are on Wednesday, February 23rd and Thursday, March 24th. This semester we are featuring new tenure track uh, faculty in the arts and humanities who joined OSU in the last two years. And we intend to continue this series in future years to feature as many new scholars as we can on our campus. Each speaker will present a pretty quick introduction to their work, uh, about five minutes each. We aren't expecting that we will have much time for Q&A, but we wanna encourage all of you here in the audience to follow up with speakers directly if you have any questions, or if you want to connect with them about possible shared interests or collaborations. So one of our goals is definitely to help foster these kinds of connections. And I think with that, we're gonna move on to our first speaker who is Mary Claire Becker from the Department of Art, Graphic Design and Art History. Hi everyone. Um, I wanna say thank you to everyone at the Humanities Initiative for putting this together. Um, my name is Mary Claire Becker. I'm in my second year as assistant professor of studio art in the Department of Art, Graphic Design and Art History. Um, my primary research interest is printmaking and I teach foundations and drawing classes for OSU. Um, I got my master's degree at University of Iowa in Iowa City and I'm originally from North Carolina. Um, so 
I, I'm not going to speak a whole lot about the content concepts behind my studio practice in just five minutes, but so I thought that five minutes felt like a good amount of time to tell you just a little bit about my process. Um, so I have a very, very short little PowerPoint to share with you about that. Um, this is me. Um, so I'm currently working on a series that I'm calling the Mosaic Virus series. It's based on images from 17th century Dutch Golden Age still lifes that feature some tulips, um, which are a kind of tulip that uh, was very prized during that time period in the Netherlands. Um, they were traded, bought and sold for a lot of money. But ironically, the same virus, the mosaic, it's, which is a kind of mosaic virus um, that causes these tulips to have their beautiful stripes also makes them very difficult to prop with the reproduction of the flower. So they're being bought and sold for a lot of money, but they're really sort of like a poor investment. The thing that makes it beautiful is also the thing that's sort of degrading the natural object. Um, so in, in my, Prints. I'm sort of taking these original images of paintings and translating them through digital and traditional printmaking practices um, to start a conversation about um, the relationship between the image and its original. So sort of like the, the beauty of that precious one of a kind flower being translated through history um, using the medium of oil paint and then digital images um, in the contemporary media landscape. Uh, so the piece that I'm sitting in front of, which I'll sort of like spin around and give you a tour of once I'm done with the PowerPoint, um, is a project that I started here at OSU with my funding from the, um, the Humanities, Arts and Sciences grant, the hat, or sorry, Humanities, <laughs> Arts and Design grant, the HAD grant, um, which I received my first year here. Um, so I started by sourcing various tulips from a variety of paintings and then digitally collaging them together using Photoshop and sort of distorting and warping the colors to make them feel surreal and strange and um, a little bit more like kitsch or pop culture interpretation of the original source material. Um, I then took that digital file and created a lino cut. So it's a type of relief carving. I'm working on um, a soft piece of linoleum and carving away the negative image area and then rolling up the remaining lines in black ink. Um, I, the funding that I received from OSU, I used to set up a yardage printing silkscreen studio at the Prairie Art Center, which is on Duck Street, um, very close to OSU campus. It's a partially funded by OSU, partially funded by the city of Stillwater. Um, and they allowed me to set up this huge fabric printing table in their space and set up my exposure unit and my wash out booth so that I would have everything that I needed to take this, um, this image and tile it to create the wallpaper that I've used to create a sculptural installation that is behind me now. Um, so it's a four layer print. So far I've printed 130. 30 feet of it and I could do three times I have materials to do three times that much if um, I end up getting an opportunity to show it in a big gallery space. Um, so here's sort of the next step. This is um, I let's see if I can play this. Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm hand cutting to create sculptural elements that then drape across the wallpaper that's attached to the wall itself. With that, I'm gonna stop sharing. And I'll hold up my computer so you can sort of see, this is the mock-up that's in my office <laughs> in the Bartlett Center on campus. Um, so I'm gonna be photographing this sculpture that I've created and then using it to submit proposals for gallery exhibitions, um, hopefully at other universities where they'll also let me give a talk to talk about my work. And just for context, it looks like it's, you know, fancy and gallery ready, but this is the space. 
<laughs> that's what the rest of the room looks like. So I'm, um, I'm, I'm using my office to its greatest capacity here in the Department of Art. And that's my whole spiel. So I'll put my contact information in the chat in case anyone wants to get in touch. And thanks for the opportunity to talk. Thank you, Mary Claire. Um, excellent sticking to the five minutes. Good job. Um, <laughs> it comes really quick, I know. Um, all right, thank you so much. Our next speaker is uh, Kaylee Hall from the English department. Hi, everyone. Yeah, thank you so much for, for being here. And Mary Claire, that was so cool to see. I apologize in advance that I don't have any exciting images to share with my um, presentation. But um, yeah, so I'm Kaylee Hall. I joined the English department in fall 2020. Um, I would say that was peak pandemic, but we've had so many peaks that it's hard to um, tell at this point. And I work on 18th and 19th century Anglophone literature. I've got a couple of research projects underway, um, but the book that I'm currently wrapping up is about digestion and indigestion in 18th and 19th century um, Anglophone literature. And I'm thinking about these things both as, as bodily processes and as kind of ways of describing the processes of literary consumption and canon formation. Um, and so since this is a little bit abstract, I wanted to tell you a little bit about how I got to here. Um, and where I hope to go as I finish wrapping things up. Um, the, the word that actually sparked my thinking for this project was bowels. And in the, 18th century, in the 18th century, bowels could refer either kind of as it does today to the digestive tract, or in this more abstract sense, bowels could mean the seat of compassion and tenderness. Um, and I noticed this like a long time ago when I was reading this early 18th century novel, Mall Flanders by Daniel Defoe for my comprehensive exams. And there is this one point where Maul um, describes seeing, if you're familiar with the book, one of the many children that she has abandoned sort of along the way of her adventures. And she describes the really like the true anguish that she feels and how she puts it like that her entrails turned and her bowels moved. And so, you know, to a 21st century reader, this is kind of an unintentionally funny moment. But, you know, obviously that's not Defoe's context. And when Maul says that her bowels moved, she's kind of, she's basically saying that her heart is breaking. And so my project is really interested in how this meaning of bowels um, as this, this locus of compassion and connection wanes over the course of the 18th century, but significantly it doesn't disappear. And then also towards the end of the 18th century, there is actually this increased attention to the digestive system as an index of individual health and kind of therefore of national health as well. And this is a time when scientific and medical research um, sort of contributes to bodies being understood in increasingly anatomical terms. And I've found that this anatomical focus along with kind of changing agricultural practices, Britain's growing empire, um, means that many Britons become much more concerned with controlling how their alimentary canals are connecting them to the wider world, both the human and non-human wider worlds. And um, my project, however, is kind of primarily focused on literature that is representing and interrogating failures to control this alimentary porosity. Um, the standard response that you get um, from someone like a popular medical writer like William Buchan, who wrote Domestic Medicine, which is basically the WebMD of the 18th century, he kind of says, you know, indigestion is a result of urbanizing, industrializing, increasingly global society. And what you need to do is get to, to get back to the land, to tilling the earth um, in order to restore balance. And one of the ironies of this, of course, is that um, with the sort of in this, you know, increased preoccupation with the healthfulness of individual small gardening occurs alongside the rise of agrarian and plantation capitalism. Um, and doctors like Buchan are primarily concerned with white middle class male bodies and their health and defining kind of health and pathology with these bodies in mind. Um, whereas the texts that I examine in my project are kind of much more equivocal about hearty, healthy guts and um, attempts to control the relationship between human bodies, food, and the non-human world. Um, and so I've always really been intrigued by the unruliness of bodies and how literature so often elides that unruliness. 
And um, my project, um, which I don't know if I told you the title of it, it's, it's called Gut Reading Literature, Environmental Culture, and the Elementary Body. It's focusing on what's significant about these kind of relatively rare cases when writers are attending to the unavoidable um, realities of embodiment. Um, so it's, you know, thinking about it in the 18th and 19th um, centuries, primarily in British literature, but um, also kind of, you know, thinking about guts um, today um, in this sort of new moment of thinking about microbiomes and um, how there are sort of these surprising continuities between the time I study and today. So thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to hearing about other people's research. Thank you so much, Kaylee. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things that um, came to mind was just remembering that there are um, new communities currently um, developing on campus focused on things like um, the medical humanities. And so I think that's definitely a, a place where a lot of um, new scholars are uh, bringing interest onto campus um, connected to pandemics, but also in this more kind of um, historical purview. So thank you so much for that. Okay, let's see. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Brandy Thomas-Wells um, from the History Department. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to get to know um, the amazing research, to learn about the amazing research that other people are doing. Um, and I can see some collaborations happening already. And so I look forward uh, to the remaining events as well. I'll, I'll start by telling you just a little bit about me and how I ended up in the digital humanities, more specifically digital history, and a really cool project that I completed uh, with students or that I, that I begun with students here at OSU. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of History where I specialize in African-American history, women's history, uh, women and gender history. And uh, more specifically, I focus on social movements. I do a lot with uh, studying women's organizations, particularly as they uh, work to pursue uh, civil rights at home and human rights more broadly. I'm currently working on my first monograph, which is entitled, The World is Going to Hear From Us. And I do that work by looking at two national Black women's organizations and the connections that they made with women in Europe, um, Africa, Asia, uh, from the 1890s to the 1960s. And it's a rather big project um, and I'm really enjoying uh, doing that. Um, I got my start in digital history as a PhD candidate at uh, The Ohio State. Um, I did my master's thesis on the connections between and the collaborations between Black South African women and African American women. And I pushed that time period back to the 1920s and 1930s. Because usually when we think about the connections between these two groups, we think about the, the modern civil rights movement and uh, the movement against apartheid. And so what I wanted to do was see if there were conversations um, that were happening earlier, and indeed they there were. And so I focused on um, Black women who worked to uh, improve the conditions of the Black population while the Union of South Africa, the, this empire was still being formed. And so I joined the board of uh, uh, Women in Social Movements and Modern Empire, and I also um, I published a project with them on Black women and Black South African women. And so I really encourage you to check out this project if you do anything with Empire, anything with women and gender. It's a massive project with 75,000 pages of primary source materials, essays that introduce those materials. And we focus on all kinds of themes, um, colonization, resistance, um, settlement. And so it's, it's a really, really good resource. And I'm, I'm still active um, with that project. 
Uh, in terms of my interest in the digital humanities, I love digital archives, right? And I'm really interested in building digital archives, particularly that are public facing. Uh, what I love the most about digital humanities is the accessibility of it all, right? Um, and being able to bring in diverse voices and to reach diverse people. And so that is, um, for me, uh, first and foremost, my passion for digital humanities. Um, particularly, I love digital visualizations, interactive maps, and working on timelines. And I do this in my own work, but I especially like bringing students on board and teaching them the different ways that we can use the digital humanities for research, but also to share our research. And so one of those projects that begun uh, last year is called Women of Black Wall Street. And I worked on this project along with students in my digital methods course in history. When I arrived at OSU in uh, 2018, I knew that I wanted to be a part of the conversation on the Tulsa Race Massacre. And originally I was doing all of this work by myself. And I had come up with a list of women and I was reading all of these great secondary sources um, and I was working alone. And there was a student by the name of Elizabeth Thomas who wanted to complete an honor section with me. And originally she wanted to work on podcasts but I was able to convince her to work on this project with me and I'm so glad she did. And so she was also in that class and her along with Michaela Swanson, who was a member of that class became digital interns the following semester. And they worked on gathering um, all of these really cool materials and sort of cleaning up the biographies um, or finalizing the biographies that were written by other students in the class who are listed here. I'm very happy uh, to say that Elizabeth, uh, Trader Johnston and Piper Reese will join me in conversation on Tuesday, February the 1st. And of course, this is a great time to again thank the Humanities Initiative for sponsoring that event. I can't wait to sit down and talk to the students about what they did. And so very quickly, if you're interested in going to the website um, and seeing the cool work that we did, there are 10 biographies there right now. Um, these women, uh, these students started with just the name of these women um, and they really recovered their lives. We did a lot with maps. So we have historic and contemporary maps. There's some cool stuff there like famous, a famous historic recipe. Um, there are interviews with contemporary uh, black women who own businesses in Greenwood today and background essays. So I encourage you to use it um, in your teaching or just to check it out if you want to know a bit more. And I'm very happy to say that this is a project that I will continue to build here at OSU. I will build it in digital methods, but I will also build it in Oklahoma history. And so that is my spiel. Thank you so very much for allowing me to share that with you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, just to, for those of you who came a little bit late, um, Dr. Wells is gonna be presenting with um, those three students, former students that she mentioned on um, February 1st. So if you wanna find more information about how to register for that virtual event, you can go to our website. Um, but we're really excited to be um, not just featuring that project because of its um, importance um, in terms of its uh, kind of contribution to research on Black Tulsa, but also the way that it features both digital humanities and work with students. And um, I think it's just a really um, stellar project in, in all of those ways. So thank you again. Um, and our next speaker, is Rebecca Kaplan, Dr. Rebecca Kaplan in the history department. So I am turning it over to you. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I am Dr. Rebecca Kaplan, also in the history department, just like Dr. Wells. And I am a first year who is part of a cohort of people who are hired to participate in the new pandemic center. Um, I know you'll be hearing from other members of the center here on uh, other sessions. And you guys are not getting images from me today because I am a historian of health sciences with an MS in epidemiology. And I focus on 
animal disease, non-human animal diseases, zoonotic infection, and human non-human animal relationships. And I know it's a lunchtime lecture. No one wants to see a lot of dead animals in collie pits. If you if you want images, ask me for them. I got tons of them, but just not great for a lunchtime humanities chat. Um, and so, yeah, I. Um, um, and so I really work with a One Health framework, and One Health is the idea that animals, non-human animals, and environmental health are interrelated, and you can't understand a disease unless you look across these populations. It's inherently an interdisciplinary and collaborative field, so I would definitely reach out. Um, I'm already, you know, finding so many great people just in our little chat today to reach out to and uh, think about potential collaborations. Um, my first book project is on a disease called brucellosis, also a lot of times known as Malta fever, undulant fever, contagious abortion. Um, it's a multi-species history of a non-fatal infectious disease, something that's understudied um, in history of medicine, um, non-fatal -fe uh, infectious diseases. And I'm looking at how medical and scientific theory, economics, environment, Politics, gender, and technology frame brucella illnesses in the United States, the creation, dissemination of knowledge about them, and the policy over disease control and eradication. Um, and then on top of the book project, I also have a current research project on foot and, foot and mouth disease in North America. And this is not what your kids have got in hand, foot and mouth disease, completely different virus. Um, it's a disease that infects cloven hoof animals like cow, swine, deers. And looking at it across uh, the North American continent is allowing me to dive into issues of borders, borderlands, policing the movement of human and non-human animal bodies in environmental settings, the creation and circulation of knowledge amongst researchers, animal health professionals, animal owners, and agriculture communities in Mexico, the United States, and Canada, the mil militarization of animal disease eradication and transnational policy. Um, and, you know, I'm very lucky that the Pandemic Center is creating a space for me to work interdisciplinary with the cohort in there and people across the campus, and that also the Humanities Initiative is already providing that platform as well. I know I've met some of you um, amongst those who are uh, our little group of disability studies and medical humanities interested folks. Um, and I have to say, I'm particularly interested in developing the medical humanities side of things, both in research and teaching um, and thinking about ways to bring the humanity to scientific spaces and programs on this campus and in the community in general. Um, so that is something I'm really interested in talking and developing and thinking about, uh, you know, I'm very lucky in my history medicine class this semester, it's almost all science students. And so it's great, they're coming into the history department and how can we take the history out to them and all the humanities out to them? Uh, my dream someday of that's just going to be part of the required coursework, right? Um, uh, and I love having guest lectures in my courses. I love doing field trips. I love, you know, uh, doing projects. Um, so, for example, this semester that history medicine course is being taught is health and social movements in the United States. Cali, we're actually talking about gram, uh, Gramite diets and like the body and politics in a class on Wednesday. It's like, you would be great to come in and talk. Um, so, yes, if anyone wants to guest lecture, has a grad student wants to guest lecture, uh, later on we're doing like art, uh, protest art, and we're doing the whole art thing. So if, you, if you're like, yo, oh, it'd be really great to do a project with you and your students, I am open to all of those things. Um, I'm uh, really excited to have these opportunities to collaborate both in the research space and in the teaching space and then also in the public space. So I'm gonna, you know, my five minutes coming to a close here, I'm just gonna pop in the chat. Um, a recent podcast I did, I have to promote uh, Dr. Eisenberg's on here somewhere, um, he, and you'll be hearing from him in a future session. Uh, he has a great podcast called Infectious Historians. I was on it recently. I'll pop the link into that. You should listen, not just to my episode, but the whole run of shows. And I'll pop in an exhibit I did with the Science History Institute about the role of animals in the making of human um, immunity. So basically role of animals in vaccination and the making of human immunity. And thanks for having me today. Thank you. Um, that is fantastic. And there's so many interesting connections that um, I can see uh, happening already amongst our speakers. And um, it's really exciting to, to think about what
collaborations might happen in the future. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think especially at a place like OSU um, with our robust egg and animal sciences component, um, there's, there's all kinds of um, really interesting things that could happen in connection with our colleagues on kind of the other side of campus, right? Um, all right, so thank you so much again. Our next speaker um, is Carol Reddy, Dr. Carol Reddy from Languages and Literatures. Thanks for having me. And yes, I am Carol Reedy. It looks like Reddy, but it's pronounced Reedy, but that's okay. Um, I just want to thank, before I, before I get started, I want to thank my colleague, Dr. Alvarez Sancho, who was very encouraging in coming to the Humanities Initiative. I uh, identify as a linguist, I'm a sociolinguist, but I look to a lot of humanities research and researchers to uh, supplement my work. And so that is kind of the frame I'm going to be talking about today. So thank you, Dr. Dr. Alvarez Sancho. Um, so I'm just going to share this quick little PowerPoint uh, to show you some of the cool language data that I'm working with. Um, uh, because, of course, um, I also have my website there, which um, I update occasionally with some of my talks and research projects that I'm working on, and you can email me if you're interested. But my research broadly um, deals with language use and language linguistic practices, more on the linguistic end and how um, those elements, uh, languages come together. Multilingual research um, is predominantly my, my area of research. But I'm also looking at social identity. So a typical problem within sociolinguistics and social uh, science research in general is that some of the ways that we understand these um, very dynamic uh, things like identity is in a very static way and sort of categorization. So I'm looking to um, expand those um, operationalizations of uh, to understand better understand identity and language and how they work together to then um, and how they are um, then understood in terms of our broader ideologies and understanding of how we use language in society, right? So this is just one of the examples of analysis that I do that I've been doing. Um, I primarily look at narratives uh, to see how uh, individuals construct their sense of self through narrative uh, using different language features. And so these are three uh, levels of narrative analysis that I conduct. Um, I'm looking particularly at the speakers and how they talk about each other within the story. So that's positioning one, level one. Level two, um, I look at you know, myself and the speaker within that frame of the interview. And then of course the, 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 the broader context. Um, and this, this, actually, this framework was actually developed um, from um, the notion of uh, positioning um, by Davies and, and Harry and very much influenced by Bakhtin's work. Um, so this is some of the data that I'm working with. Um, and so a lot of the, the, the participants that I um, uh, interview are multilingual speakers of Arabic, Spanish, English, and French, and they reside in um, Spain. So I deal with migration linguistics, dias uh, diaspora populations, predominantly Arabic speakers. So in this excerpt we see, um, which I don't think we'll listen to, but um, it's on my website as well if you're interested in listening to it. Um, but we see that there's example of, we have Fusha classical Arabic, we have the more colloquial, colloquial Arabic, we also have French, um, there's English at some point and Spanish as well. So we have a lot of different language features to discuss and frequently linguists get into the nitty gritty of how are these things being put together? But, and that's interesting, but I'm looking at, okay, what does this mean for their sense of self within their new society? So I'm looking at this as, as a, it's not a typical narrative, um, but it is a narrative format. So looking at identity within this narrative format. Um, so I'm gonna stop share here. Uh, my newer projects relate to the idea of chronotope as well, time and space, conceptualizations of time and space within these narratives and how speakers um, position themselves in time and space as uh, migrants or not. Um, but I'm also looking to develop research further with Spanish speakers in the United States, particularly Spanish speakers in Oklahoma. I'm hoping to develop a corpus or very, very much in line with digital humanities and digital archives, um, collecting narratives and stories of uh, Spanish speaking populations in Oklahoma. 
Uh, right now we have a very interesting thing happening in Oklahoma where we have a lot of Spanish speaking individuals who have been in the United States for quite some time. They're moving from other regions that are predominantly, that are very much Spanish speaking in the United States, as well as migrants coming from uh, directly from Spanish speaking countries. So we have an interesting context situation linguistically, but also lots of interesting stuff happening in terms of identity and, and our relation, their relation to their society. So that is about my research and I'm happy to answer any questions and thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Um... Yeah, really interesting. Um, you probably have one more minute and I did have one question, which is just, I was curious um, what your teaching focus is in the department since you're a linguistics uh, scholar. So how does that work with um, your department? Yeah, thank you. I forgot to mention that. So I do teach lower level Spanish classes, um, but I teach upper level classes as well for Spanish majors in the linguistics. So I teach them uh, the sound system of Spanish and also understanding the sociolinguistics of Spanish. But right now I'm teaching a general education course. Um, so I have students from engineering, art, um, and the courses of is language and migration. So we're looking at um, diaspora populations and how they use language. What does it mean when language is mobile? So the language features themselves, but also their um, the identity aspect is very big. And we actually did just have a discussion just yesterday. We just started our discussion on narratives. So um, they're already getting into it using their, you know, analyzing the different levels of narration that they see um, and what it means for their identity construction. So um, that is, that's my teaching. Fantastic, thank you. Um, wonderful, all right. We are gonna keep uh, moving along here. Our, um, our next speaker is Tyler Austin from the music department. Hi everyone, it's great to see you all today. I did want to clarify, I actually uh, previously at Oklahoma State served as assistant director of bands in a teaching assistant professor career track um, capacity, and I'm currently serving in an interim uh, capacity this year as associate director of bands, but several of my colleagues encouraged me to still apply and talk about my research. So I'm, uh, I am not tenure track, but I am uh, in the associate director of bands position, which normally is a tenure track line. Um, most visibly, you probably know me as the director of Cowboy Marching Band, so you've probably seen me standing on a ladder at Cowboy football games. Um, and even though that doesn't necessarily uh, correlate directly with my uh, artistic identity as a conductor, it does really speak to the area of my major focus in my research, which is wind music in the community. Uh, so wind music, unlike orchestral music or um, uh, like instrumental jazz or opera really only exists within the academic world. So the best wind ensembles in the world are really performing in the university environment. Um, and I'm interested in taking wind music um, and new music and making them more accessible uh, to the wider community. So I have two examples of different projects um, that I would like to share with you today. The first one is a project that I completed with our new music ensemble at Oklahoma State, which is called Frontiers. Um, and this was a collaboration that I did with Kelly Kerr, who at the time was working in the communications school. And this piece is called Red Vesper, and it's sort of a meditation on the power of the um, national parks in America. And uh, my whole focus with this video performance was sort of to make uh, the music seem human. So you'll notice that there are points where the cameras get very close to the musicians. And I really want uh, any uh, listener to understand that it's a person playing the instrument.
you'll also notice that there are some electronic sounds of woof howls and wildlife that are mixed in with the acoustic performance of this piece. And then the second piece that I would like to share with you uh, is with my professional ensemble, Maryland Chamberwinds. I'm originally a Marylander. And uh, we are actually one of only two professional Chamberwinds ensembles uh, that operate in the country. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization uh, that focuses on educational programming for students that otherwise would not have access um, to high quality musicians. Uh, you'll notice in this performance, our professor, assistant professor of oboe, Andrew Parker, uh, is one of the performers. So I managed to lure him to Maryland last summer, and we're so excited to also have him as a part of the project. Performers with Maryland Chamberwinds come from major universities around the country, uh, as well as from some of the top performing ensembles, including New York City Ballet. Um, and it's really one of the greatest parts of my life work that I always uh, try to find musicians that not only are incredible at their instrument, but are also incredible humans. And it's this really, um, it's, I, I view it very much as a humanitarian ensemble where we can all come together and focus on teaching and making great music, but most importantly, in just sharing that humanistic artistic experience. So that's my research. And again, thank you so much for letting me share a little bit with uh, you today. Thank you. Um... It's really um, fun that we have uh, kind of expanded our conversation to both the arts and humanities in, the, in these presentations. Um, and I'm really appreciative to all of you um, for bringing um, our attention to perhaps facets of, of campus that um, in, in every one of your presentations that we maybe aren't as familiar with. So um, I really appreciate that. Okay, we have one more presenter for today. And um, then we may we may end up having a few minutes um, for Q and A. So certainly people can be thinking about that. Um, well, we'll use up our time um, until one if we have uh, questions. So um, feel free to be thinking about that. Um, our last um, presenter today is Jenny Lamb from Theater. Hi, you all. Another arts person. <laughs> um, so. Um, um, I'm an assistant professor of theater and uh, the director of performance here at the theater department at Oklahoma State. Um, this is my second year. Um, my third year here, my second year on a tenure track, I started out as a visiting assistant professor. Um, so I'm a practitioner. So my research is in practicing, um, not so much a scholar, but a practitioner. So my research is in performance. My research is in performance, it's in directing um, with an emphasis in physical theater, movement direction, intimacy design, and the practical application of the Alexander technique. So I'm assuming a lot of these terminology might not be on everybody's tongue or understanding. So I'll just briefly kind of explain a little bit. I'm an actor by trade, so I'm a performer. So a lot of my research is an actual performance of, of doing theater, writing about it. Um, reflecting back, taking best practices of pedagogy that I'm putting into my acting classes and doing that myself. Um, directing, I direct shows. We do four shows a year here at um, Oklahoma State University, and I hope that you all have maybe seen some shows or maybe we'll start coming to shows now that we, you know that we have a theater department that produces really, really amazing high quality work and we have super talented students and super talented other faculty that serve as designers. Um, so check out our stuff. Um, um, in physical theater. So physical theater, um, how that differs from other theater is just physical storytelling. So removal of text 
and telling stories through physical means, be that movement, um, and also incorporates a lot of mask work. Um, it delves into uh, Commedia dell'arte. Um, so physical theater, physical expression, physical storytelling with the erasure of text from that. Um, movement direction, so it's kind of a newish thing in our industry. Um, I'm sure you all might be familiar with what a choreographer does with a musical, um, choreographing dance, but a movement director comes in to help establish movement vocabulary for actors and directors to use. Um, not so much choreograph things, but define and develop a sense of the world of the play through the way that the characters move through the space. Um, intimacy design. So you might be familiar with fight direction, people that choreograph fights in movies, film, TV, um, theater. But in the last maybe five years, intimacy direction has become a really big part of our industry. And that is the choreography of intimacy, right? Stage intimacy. So that can go into kissing, touching. It could um, lure into sexual um, uh, sexual storytelling, which we see a lot in TV and film, right? Um, so know that there is now intimacy directors who help actors um, navigate that chore choreography. It used to be back in the day that directors would be like, oh, you kiss here, go figure it out in the corner and come back and show us what you have, which is not um, safe practices for actors, um, especially young actors. So it's really important in our young actor training to establish clear uh, rules of consent and boundaries. Um, so into, I study intimacy direction, direction as well. Um, and I also study the Alexander technique, which might be familiar to some people, but it's basically, oh, how do I explain this? I should get better at my, my little 30 second pitch of what the Alexander technique, but it's use of, um, use of your spine, use of your body, best practices, um, finding more ease and less effort um, in a world that brings us down. The Alexander technique helps us um, remain so that um, longevity of body is really essential as a performing artist. And so my research is in how the Alexander technique comes into performance. Um, so this is a lot. Um, so performance wise, what um, my research is, is into best practices in the studio, including consent, um, including decentering the teacher as expert in the room and centering students and using trauma informed and anti racist practice in the studio. Um, performance wise, I'm working currently on crafting a one woman show because hey, there's not a lot of theater, COVID, Broadway shutting down. I'm sure you all understand uh, how that affects research. So it led me to um, work solo. Oh, and I'm producing a one woman show. It's called Jenny Does Juice. And it's a uh, homage to country singer Juice Newton um, and her 1981 album called Juice. Um, it had a pivotal effect on me as a young child. And so now I'm integrating um, the importance of music, how music is a timestamp for us. Music is tactile. Music takes us back to a place in time. So taking people through my journey of Jenny Does Juice. Um, directing, I in the fall I directed our production here of The Wolves um, by Sarah DeLapp and I also, um, what I research in directing is non-traditional theater configuration. So not your typical sit in the audience and watch a show. I'm interested in exploring the relationship between uh, the performance and the audience and kind of breaking, breaking that gray area. I'm interested in immersive style theater theater, non-traditional theater configuration, and movement as a storytelling device. Um, and I do have a clip that I can show you of The Crucible. I was a movement director on The Crucible. I'm horrible at screen sharing, so ooh, apologies, you all. Um, and it's just like a little clip that hopefully might show a little bit what a movement director does. And it's a storytelling through a transition. Instead of going to blackout in my shows, I like to have use the um, transitions as storytellers. So let me see if this works. Hopefully you can see this. Oh God, can you see this everyone? Okay, and it's just a little clip from um, our production of The Crucible. And we will burn. We will burn together.
And that's just a little clip of a transition sweeping away of things. Um, well, I know I'm running out of time, so let me see what else. Um, um, so physical theater interested in exploring storytelling without text so that it crosses language barriers, that it crosses cultural barriers, like what is the essential story? How do we tell it with our body? When a lot of times we like to use text, um, what can our body say? What can our breath say instead of text? Um, and Alexander Technique um, is a mind-body connection, right? So that's essential research for me, how when we think of like, oh, I have all of this to do at home, my body is in kinesthetic response to that. So that mind-body connection. Um, and I'm working on a paper with a fellow collaborator at the University of Wisconsin-Madison on um, physicalization of text, which is this mind-body connection, how... Um, when we think of text, we don't necessarily think of it existing within us physically, but we all have a memory. If I say the word love, you have an image that comes to your mind. Um, you have an experience that happens in your body. So why? <laughs> why and why when actors get connected to, the, to physicalizing text, how it improves their performance, gets them more authentically embodied into character? Is it a brain synapse thing? Um, is, what is it? So we're in research on that. And, um, that's it. We'll say full stop. There you go. Thank you so much. Um, those presentations were all wonderful and so informative. And um, I really appreciate everybody um, participating and to everyone who's here attending. Um, we do have just a couple more minutes if anyone is interested in um, asking a question, we can certainly take a moment for that. If anyone um, uh, wants to uh, extend the conversation in some direction, that's that's fine too. Um, I see uh, Renee McNeil has her hand raised. So Renee. I do, I have a question for um, Dr. Wells, um, particularly about the, um, the women of Black Wall Street. Um, I've had the opportunity, Dr. Wells, to um, use your site to teach in my intro to Africana Studies class. And can I just say, the students just love it. Oh, wow. um, and so my question to you is, what are some of the responses that you've gotten from this wonderful work and how has it um, maybe helped you to um, um, cultivate the directions in which you want to expand this work? Thank you so much for that question. Um, the responses have been um, really overwhelming. People like the website um, and I am so happy that it doesn't just reach um, people in the academy, students and, and scholars, but um, also the general public. And so as a part of the answer, I'll say, I receive emails from Oklahomans all the time. And I really just uh, love the way in which they reflect on what they learned about the massacre, right? And many people learned about it as a riot. So I, I mean, I have emails uh, from people who are, you know, I think the youngest has been 16 all the way up to some people in their 90s. And they just really think about, um, it, the website just really allows them to reflect and they give really good ideas about future directions too. So you asked a question about future directions. So uh, one of the ways in which I want to grow the project is to um, have it uh, interactive by having, so they have these, we have these biographies of these women who own stores, who own hair salons. And one of the ideas that I uh, crafted with working with uh, Black uh, feminist uh, digital scholars is a day in the life of a Greenwood woman where she goes to the grocery store, she goes to get her hair done, she might stop by the bookstore. And so that would make it even more um, sort of interactive for, for youth. And so that's a future direction. So there are a lot of exciting ways. And I will say that in part, I'm really interested in what the students can bring. So with this particular uh, set of students, they wanted to interview contemporary women and that was not on my radar. And so the students bring just such amazing things to the project. And so I look forward to seeing what students uh, bring to future iterations. So thank you so much for that question. Thank you. 
Any other questions that uh, we can take this opportunity to ask? Um, I don't necessarily have a question, <laughs> Jennifer, but um, I am a curator of education at the OSU Museum of Art. My name is uh, Christina Elliott, and maybe you didn't realize that we have a museum uh, with a permanent collection of over 5,000 objects that now has an online database, um, which was just released online last week. And so I can put the link in our notes here. Um, but I definitely extend a warm welcome from the museum and in, invite y'all to reach out and make an appointment to come see the museum yourself. I can give you a tour of our fabulous vault um, or book any number of uh, different tour types that we have with your students. We can even make special accommodations if you're looking for something in particular or want to tackle um, a certain topic. We're always on board with interdisciplinary learning. So don't be shy. Say hi. Thank you, Christina. Um, as, as art department uh, people who uh, do work quite a bit with the museum, I can say that working with Christina is an absolute pleasure. Um, I've done some great um, projects and classes working with her in the collection. And so um, she will bend over backwards to make something work for your class. So it's, it's really wonderful. And I'm so glad that you could be here. Um, all right, I think, I think we're probably at the end of our time today, um, but I just wanna say thank you to everyone for being here, everyone who presented, as well as everyone who attended. And um, this really sets a, a high bar, I think, but hopefully a, um, a good one to use for our um, two following sessions. Again, we have two more of these planned um, in February and March, and you can go to our website um, in the programming section and, and uh, get the registration info, but also see who's, who's on the lineup for um, our coming um, events. And I just wanted to mention again, for those who were, um, maybe not here right at the beginning of our session, um, that our hope is that this will be a kind of series that we continue on in future years, featuring the research of, um, you know, kind of newish uh, scholars across um, the arts and humanities. Um, so if you have colleagues who um, are, you know, interested in, in doing this uh, kind of presentation as well, we're gonna continue this series and just keep it going on and on in, in coming semesters. So um, thank you again, everyone, and um, have a wonderful rest of your day. <laughs>